My name is Amy Arn. I think I know pretty much everybody on here, but um, I'm the executive director for Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. As you know, we're a 501c3 nonprofit established in 1997 to support Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge's youth development programs, public use projects, and most recently land acquisition and restoration work. Thank you all for your understanding as we pivot back to a virtual format. We're really looking forward to taking a break from everything else going on this evening and we're eager, eager to introduce you to our experts who we're going to be on the boat with us tonight. Each of them have a wealth of knowledge in the areas of local history, biology, the refuge, and the lake itself. So today we are joined by Ohio Division of Wildlife Wetland Habitat Coordinator Dave Sherman. Wave Dave! We've got Matt Seifert, who is a grass carp strike team technician for the University of Toledo and has pretty much the most interesting, I was going to say badass, but it's recording, so I probably shouldn't, but the most badass title I think I've ever heard in the conservation universe. Wait, Matt. <laughs> We've got Tom Bartlett, who's master bird bander and educator. I know you always say retired educator, but do you really ever retire from that? And uh, Rebecca is our visitor services specialist on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service side stuff. She's been at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge for the past 25 years and starts us off with uh, one of her passions, which is the history of the island. Rebecca, you want to hop on and say hi? Uh, She's multitasking here. Well. I will move ahead here. Oh, so okay. Rebecca is helping out at the football game at the moment too. So she actually recorded her stuff in advance for you. <laughs> I, w I waved real quick, but hi everybody. <laughs> All right, so this is Rebecca and uh, Rebecca prepared a video for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and we'll get started with that part. Um, I was gonna ask everybody to remain muted for you know just background noise, keep our presenters happy, but there's so, so few of us that we're probably okay with leaving it on. And if you have questions or anything, go ahead to raise your hand or just hop right in there and say something. Um, and I'll uh, go ahead and we'll get started with Rebecca's video. Maybe. Hi, and welcome to a little bit about West Sister Island's history. Um, we're going to go as far back as we can um, to the documented history of West Sister Island and just share. what we've been able to find. We uh, only own part of the island, which I'll get to later, so we don't know everything. Everything isn't in our records, but of course, thanks to the wonders of the internet, we find more and more um, every time we look. Um, it was in the region of West Sister Island that uh, Commodore Oliver Perry in the War of 1812 defeated the British in the Battle of, e of Lake Erie and sent his famous message to General Harrison. We have met the enemy and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. The original lighthouse was built in 1821. And we have not been able to find any photos yet. As I said, uh, the wonders of the internet, people love lighthouses. There's many places out um, in the world where um, people are posting different, um, different photos, information that they have about different lighthouses. So um, I don't know if any were ever taken, but if they were, we hope to find them someday. So this tower that you can still see on the island today was built in 1848, and this photo was taken in 1858. And as you can see, there are two people in the, in the photo, one standing in the door and uh, one working over here. The original keeper's quarters was a small brick building, 20 feet by 30 feet. Um, that's 
not a lot bigger than our offices at work. And they started out with 10 lamps with 14 inch reflectors and that produced a fixed white light, no flashing, no movement as we see now, but that was later increased to 11 lamps. So it was a little bit brighter. And they put, uh, and I meant to look up how to pronounce this, I think it's Fresnel lens um, in the tower in 1857. And that's the one that we see in most modern lighthouses. They, well, more modern lighthouses. They would rotate and you could have a pattern so that you knew if you saw a flashing light, it could be recognized as to which lighthouse it was. The new quarters were built in 1868. It included a walkway to the tower. Um, wasn't a small, small building. You can see um, um, someone who um, was working on the island there along the shore. And the walkway to the tower is this covered walkway right here so that they did not have to go out um, into the severe weather to keep the lighthouse lit. They dug a well on the island in 1886 to replace the cistern that was collecting rainwater before that. And an oil house was built in 1890. This is pretty exciting because until then, the oil for the lighthouse had been stored in that walkway between the buildings and before that in the building itself. So nobody really wants to sleep with a bunch of flammable oil in their homes. So that was a big improvement to life on the island. The biggest improvement to life on the island came in 1902 when they added a second story to the keeper's house and they added a boathouse, a barn, chicken house, a carpenter shop, a schoolroom, and even a playhouse. And this is one of the few photos where you can see the light of the boathouse and there were families living on the island and clearly if they had a chicken house they had livestock there was often a cow um, one year there was a horse that stayed on the island and that was because no matter what its owner tried they could not keep the horse in its corral so they sent it to the island for the summer where it could not possibly run away and um, families require school and, and a school so a school room and I know they kept a lot of rabbits and a variety of other um, farm animals were kept there too. There's a photo from 1904. Again, there is a person on the porch of the, the house. This one was undated, but from a similar time frame. Another view. It's, it's much grander than uh, I picture a lighthouse out on an island in Lake Erie to be um, a nice little porch. I imagine it was, it was a nice, but probably a little lonely place to stay. So there's so many stories that come um, off the island and, and some we know are false. Some are just interesting. And um, so 1938, there was a squatter living on the island and the U.S. attorney had, he had to um, write a letter to ask him to remove himself from the island. Um, this one I love. So they kept turkeys. I said a variety of things were kept and some people stayed all winter. Sometimes people only stayed in the summer. If the ice, if the lake froze, the, then there were no ships and then the light did not have to be kept lit. But um, so the lighthouse keeper kept a flock of turkeys and they butchered 75 turkeys and the tugboat, um, which we've seen here on the refuge overnight, it gets cold and things ice up. And um, the tug that was coming to get the boat to take them to market couldn't make it to the island because the ice, uh, stopped it within sight of the family, but obviously not thick enough to move across, but too thick to get the boat through. So his daughter recalls it was turkey morning, noon, and night that winter. And to that day that she told the story, she had not eaten a single bite of turkey. 
That's a lot of turkey. <laughs> um, this, you know, so many of the stories from the island involve some heartbreak, some sadness. Um, it was not active, you know, modern, modern healthcare has done so much for us, but the people of the island were not only remote, but we did not have um, the modern services that we do now. So uh, a lot of the stories are heartbreaking, but a lot of them also involve some amazing um, feats by the people living out there. And Chauncey Fitz Morris, who um, started out there in 1909, he did some amazing rescues and there was a 45 foot yacht, the Luella, that capsized two miles off the island in a very severe storm. And he took his boat from the island out and chopped a hole in the side of the yacht and saved five adults and a baby um, out of the hull of, of that boat. So, or five adults and a baby. So, um, that's pretty amazing, but he clearly earned some other um, awards for his service. And uh, this one really breaks my heart, but the 20 year old daughter of one of the lighthouse keepers was on the island for two years. And they say was slowly driven mad by the loneliness of being on the island. Um, I'm thinking it's safe to assume it was not the loneliness of the island that drove her mad and um, it was probably some other mental health condition and um, she did commit suicide while she was out uh, living on the island with her family. So you can get many of these stories and and more um, in a couple of books. One is um, by one of our former refuge volunteers and somebody we love dearly, Martha Dykes. And um, she wrote a book on Lake Erie's West Sister Island. And um, she compiled many of the stories that she found through research and, and other things. But then there's also a story that um, Gladys McMeans wrote. And it's stories of her mother. Her mother was the daughter of a lighthouse keeper and she lived on the island for quite a while. So um, My Island Home is that story. And we also in the visitor center, if we ever get to open up again and, and open things up, we have a, a painting that she did of the lighthouse based on how her mother described it. So that's pretty, pretty neat connection. But I, these are both available in the from the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge in their store. And they're wonderful reading. I've read each of them a couple of times. So sadly, the end of an era, no more um, living on the light on the island. They automated the light in 1937. So the um, glass portion at the top was removed and that's what you will still see today. And the, um, lantern was removed and it's it's now um, powered and uh, it's a little sad it's a it's a pretty amazing time of year or time of our our history and um, but it allowed for some other great things to happen so the um, whoops There's a little more of what it looks like. And you see part of the, the house still standing next to it, or that's actually the walkway between the house and the tower. And I've been on the island. You can still see the foundation of the buildings, but it is all removed. And as near as I can tell, I cannot find anything where um, it states that the Coast Guard went out and removed buildings or anything was taken down. But there were some interesting things that happened on the island post-1937. So that could explain some of um, the destruction of, of those buildings. But also, even though the island is completely off limits to humans, that doesn't mean there aren't humans on the island. So, you know, people obviously want to write their names. Um, on a lighthouse, and they um, also sometimes go exploring and keep souvenirs and things. 
So five acres of the 82 acre island are still owned by the Coast Guard and they own that part that's right around the lighthouse. And um, so you will occasionally see a difference. We say we have an 82 acre island or we say we have a 77 acre refuge. Um, that's why, because the refuge is not actually the entire island. I love this story. They didn't know what county the island was in. Um, until 1933, it was assumed it was in Ottawa County. But then they searched the records and all the way back to 1783, when um, there was the treaty between Great Britain and the United States that established um, the boundary between the two countries of Canada and the United States. And then that um, led through the paperwork to the state legislation that settled the Ottawa Lucas County line. And it turns out it is in Lucas County. So like I said, there've been some interesting visitors to the island and um, it's apparently a popular spot to take a break um, for a variety of reasons. And one of those was during prohibition when um, we had a lot of, mm -hmm activity um, transporting um, alcohol across the lake and um, John Zetzer was apparently a quite well-known rum runner from um, Port Clinton area and um, he would take his plane and sometimes stop out on the island. I talked to a former resident of um, what is now the beach at, at McGee Marsh and he told me that his mom, his dad would be transporting items across the lake and they had a signal. Um, if, the, if the law enforcement was hanging around, then um, she would hang, or I forget which, if it was laundry was on the line, it was safe, or if it wasn't, it was safe. But it involved hanging laundry out on the line when they were coming in because they could see that from quite far away. So uh, the laundry was the signal. Uh, whether or not they could come into shore or whether or not they had to hang out around Lake, um, West Sister. During World War II, it was used for bombing practice. And, you know, it was declared a national wildlife refuge due to the extremely large number of um, nesting waiting birds on the island. But then they bombed it. And you know, it, it was a different time. It was um, seen as a need. They weren't, you know, they weren't, it was to practice dropping the bomb. The bomb actually exploding wasn't so important. So that wasn't, you know, they were, they were dummy canisters and things, but you, we can still find the metal canisters on the island. They're pretty rusty. And it was proposed again during 1967 and um, hmm. it was removed from the list of suitable locations, luckily. And the island honestly wasn't as grown up um, during World War II. It still had a lot of that open space that we'll look at soon. Um, so not as many trees. There's rumors, and we're going to talk about a few other of the rather unusual rumors, but that um, they practiced dropping the atomic bombs um, out of the the depot up here and that's what West Sister was for. I kind of think it wasn't. So I said um, it was less treed and more open. So you can see that and you know there was it was an active farm. There were all kinds of livestock and things on the island. So you can see all of this was not um, treed. It was more pasture. When they moved off the island one of the things that didn't go with the last lighthouse keeper and family um, were domestic rabbits. They just were left to run wild until they just no longer could survive the winters out there without, um, without human care. And the domestic rabbits have, have not been seen in years, but they would keep the shrubs down a little bit and keep things growing a little slower for a while. But slowly the trees spread across um, the island towards that space. You can see it's quite quite bare out there, even though there are no building um, 
materials left on that end. We do not have a year for this. Clearly mm -hmm. it's post 1938, but you can still see that, that walkway, but the trees are coming up. There's that little bit of walkway left. Here's where the house would have been. And, you know, obviously this isn't a house that just crumbled. There just isn't enough there. So I don't know. I've never found any documentation as to where that went. There's that meadow. D the big dots in the trees. Um, I'll let someone else speak more specifically to this part of the island, but um, those are bird nests. Those are the wading birds, the herons, the egrets um, that nest in those trees. And that is why it was declared a national wildlife refuge. And then it got an extra designation in 1975. It was declared Ohio's only federal wilderness area. Now, typically wilderness areas, they had very specific criteria. It had to be a certain number of acres, um, large enough to sustain that, that undisturbed, um, undisturbed habitat. And, you know, people are allowed in some wilderness areas, but it has very specific limitations on motorized equipment, um, things like that. And so in the 70s, they went through and they said, well, we have, we have islands around um, in our federal property that are also very secluded and remote and they fit the same criteria. So they put that extra layer of protection on the island um, with good, with mixed results. Sometimes it causes problems for management and I'm pretty sure somebody else will talk about that later. So. Um, I'll let them talk about that and if they don't ask at the end. So are there graves on West Sister Island? Probably not. And the reason for that is um, it's a rock island. It has very, a very thin layer of soil on the island. Enough for the trees to grow, but not very well. Um, I don't think we'd ever get any big oak trees out there. But there is a rumor, and I love these rumors. Um, so this gentleman disappeared on July 30th, 1975. And I know some of you know who this is. It's Jimmy Hoffa. So there's a rumor that they have not found Jimmy Hoffa because he was buried on West Sister uh -oh. Island. Probably not. And I love this story. So West Sister Island isn't exactly famous. Um, it is, you know, well known for us. It's well known for the fishermen of Lake Erie because there's some great walleye fishing spots right off the island. Um, well known enough that somebody thinks Jimmy Hoffa is there, but it appeared in a TV show, sort of. Transformers animated, you know, the big alien robots that turn into other things. Um, the Dinobots live on an island called North Sister Island in Lake Erie. And I see a resemblance except for the giant volcano in the middle that uh, will give them artistic license on that one. But I think it's pretty great that, that the dino bots live on an island based off of West Sister Island. Um, it became a little more famous when Mike Rowe's Dirty Jobs came out and filmed an episode, and you can find that, Wonders of YouTube, you can watch the Dinobots too. Um, and he filmed an episode because, you know, going out on the island is very uncomfortable. Um, and I'm sure there will be more talk about this, but it smells bad, it's dirty, it involves a lot of animal product and um it's truly it's an amazing place i really love it but um it's also aptly named or described in the episode so that's what it looks like today um this small patch is where we do some management for um black ground night parents i hope dave is going to talk about that and um, you can see that all of that open area where the, uh, the meadow had been previously is gone. 
So I thank you. I hope you found that interesting. I can obviously, I only had so much time. I can talk longer. I recommend both of the books that I mentioned and um, let us know if you have any questions later. Yeah, turn my mic back on here. All right, guys, what do you think of Rebecca's presentation? Any questions for Rebecca? With me? We do not. It was very informative. Thank you. Well, I thought that was pretty exciting. I always get super excited about history kind of stuff. And stories and facts on there. Did I miss somebody there? It's always nice to have the background and the history. Yeah. And that was pretty cool. Thank you. For sure. All right, Dave, you're up next. Dave, again, is the Ohio Division of Wildlife Wetland Habitat Coordinator. He's been out on the island performing surveys and nest banding and or, uh, <laughs> surveys and bird banding management on the island. So thank you for joining us, Dave. Oh. Got to unmute there. There you go. Yep. So, of course, I'm not finding the screen that I want, which <laughs> let's see. Let me exit out. Try to bring it up. Let's see if I save it. So, anyways, yeah. So, I was a uh, wildlife biologist for a bit, and during that time, I was from '97, uh, uh, I guess 2015, 18, something like that. And then I had a job now, which is wetland habitat coordinator. So I oversee wetland projects throughout the uh, state. And see if I can, there it is. Okay. So unlike um, Rebecca's, I just got a couple pictures to spur my thoughts more than anything else. So you're Stuck with looking at my mug and look at the pictures, hopefully more than that. But so here's two of the birds that are found on there, um, the black crowned night heron and the great egret. And both of these um, prefer shorter nesting structure. Um, <clears throat> black crowned night herons, I don't know, six to eight feet. Uh, great egret is eight to 10 to 12 feet tall. So they don't like nesting in tall trees. They like nesting in the short shrubby um, trees. So like Rebecca said, what we did was we ended up taking and going out there and cutting the big trees down about waist high. And then what that did was provide nesting structures that made it real shrubby and um, areas that the herons and eagles, or the, yeah, the black crowns and the egrets like. Unfortunately, like Rebecca said, the, since it is a wilderness area, there is, there are no motors allowed on there, and that includes chainsaws. So we got to experience pioneer life for a day or two each year, and it, it sucked, basically. It was not much fun. Luckily, it was in October, November, so it was cool, but we used uh, two man saws to cut down the bigger trees and um, one man saw just the regular bow saws for the small limbs. And we could, you know, the idea was to take as many people as you could and try to clear a quarter acre or more per visit. And we got fairly decent, the tech and I got fairly decent on the um, two man saw and but it dulled fairly quickly either that or we got tired but I'm pretty sure it was the saw got dull more than us getting tired um, so the trees got a lot harder to cut 
later in the day than it did seem in the in the middle in the beginning. But um, and the numbers responded. Numbers of uh, night black crown night herons and egrets responded amazingly well. Um, the egrets nested on the edge of the cuts, and black crowns nested right in the middle. And with that, um, the numbers had been going down for both species with the cut. Now the numbers are going up. Unfortunately, I think we did, we cleared an acre and a half and I don't think anybody's been back there since that time. I know the refuge has looked at several times for getting a clearance to use a chainsaw. You, it would take two hours to do what we did in a day for the chainsaw, but they haven't been able to get that. So at some point we're gonna to need to go back out. Well, <laughs> that's not my job anymore, so I won't. But uh, um, spoken like a true state employee. Um, so I will, uh, somebody will have to go out there and cut because the numbers is starting to get, that was just after this picture here on the left was just after three or four years, um, well, maybe five. So it quickly has grown into um, a height that the night crown, black crowns aren't using as much. Um, along with the trees maturing, we also had uh, cormorants numbers increasing. And this was taken from the same general area. Um, right here is, this was in 2002. And in 2005, the pictures were about right here. And the 2007 picture is about right here. But you can see um, the cormorants were killing trees quite readily. And it wasn't necessarily, the, it's the nesting habits of the cormorants. They basically nest in very dense colonies and they're dropping nitrogen that it kills it coats the leaves, kills the trees, and kills any vegetation underneath. It'd be the same thing if you took and threw a pound of, or a 50 bag pound, or a 50 bag, 50 pound bag of fertilizer and just dumped it in about a 10 foot circle in your yard, and you wouldn't have anything grow there for years. So we could see what was gonna happen. All we need to do is look at Middle Island, which is about 20 miles to the east, and Basically what had happened out there was the cormorants started killing the trees on the outside and they were working their way to the inside. And if left unchecked, um, it would just be a big rock. We've seen it happen in a couple other islands. I think uh, East Sister, they, well, East Sister between the cormorants and the Emerald Ash Borer. I don't believe there's any trees left on East Sister. Um, so rather than watch this, um, island turned into a big rock, we decided we had to do action. So we went through the uh, necessary steps of getting permission and filing a management plan and doing an environmental assessment, environmental impact statement. And what we did, and we're still ongoing, is we started shooting cormorants to reduce their numbers. And what we found out is we do nesting counts on the island. Um, so we have a pretty good, accurate count of how many um, nests are for each species are on the island. We don't do a census, we sample, uh, I think there's 97 points or 78 points, something like that. We sample at each point, extrapolate that to the island. What we found out when we, far, when we first started shooting was that the, we, according to the previous year's data, we were removing um, a lot of cormorants, like 25% to 30% of the breeding population. But when we did the next count of the year that we did the removal, it only be reduced by 5%. So what that indicated, there was a whole lot of breeder, there was, more breeders than there was space. So long story short, we weren't gonna eliminate them from the island. We don't have any intent of that. We just wanted to reduce them to the level in which they were not damaging the island. 
And I believe that was 2,000 pairs and or 200 pairs. It's been too long ago. Um, I think it was 2,000. Anyways, there was a level we set it at. And we sometimes we go and um, do as much as many as we could remove under the permit. Other times we would only do half because the number had dropped below that level. And now um, all the birds coexisting out there and the island damage has been dramatically decreased and it's pretty much um, is green again so it was it is a success it does require maintenance and in other words we have to go out every year to make sure that the number we reduce or keep the numbers in check so it's been a great success story um, as far as being on the island, um, I believe, Amy, were you out there one year or two years, Amy? Did you, you went the, you're on mute. I think it was one year. Okay, that was probably more than that enough for a lifetime. <laughs> um, I enjoyed it, but it was, it was rough. <laughs> yeah, so this is when you, when you first walk on the island, it's usually in August. So it's about like it, and that inevitably the weather is about like we've had this past week. Very hot and steamy. Um, you step out on the island, you have, it feels like you're going back in Jurassic Park. You got herons and egrets making all kinds of weird noises. You have dead fish dropping from the trees. Um, and as you're Climbing around, you see poison ivy trees. I mean, I didn't realize that poison ivy is actually ivy is a woody plant. And there were 10, 12, 14 foot tall plants of poison ivy. Um, so you have that. And then right next to that, you have stinging nettles scattered throughout there. Um, but the worst are uh, the biting flies. They look just like lovely little house flies, except they take a chunk of flesh out, out of you that's um, just, they're the mosquito repellent, no, does have no, no effect whatsoever. There are mosquitoes out there, but the biting flies are worse. Um, you put some mosquito repellent on to keep the skeeters off you. And the last time we were out there to add more fun to this trip is that chiggers had somehow arrived on West Sister Island. Not sure how, because I had never had a single chigger bite in the 12 years I did surveys out there. And, but the last year, I thought we took one poor sap. He went out there and he didn't show up about three weeks, uh, about, I don't know, two days later, he called in sick. He said, hey, Chris, what's going on? He said, I am sitting, this is a very, bad image, but he said, I'm sitting naked in front of on a chair in front of a fan because I have 97 chigger bites on me. Oh and I was in total agony. He, you couldn't have forced him to go to West Sister on, at gunpoint after that episode. So there are chiggers out there now, but it, that was part of the reason. Um, Mike Rowe contacted us after he did the, uh, he, did the snake, la snake Island lady with on South Bass. And she said, well, you ought to go to West Sister Island because that place is a, we call it the green hell because it was <laughs> just terrible. So Mike Rowe, we do all this pre-planning. We show up, uh, it's a lovely 70 degrees, um, no flies, no mosquitoes. Uh, we walked for two hours trying to get a, heron or egret to either crap on micro or drop a dead fish on it. And finally, one of his cameramen got hit. So it, he didn't, he did not get to experience the full magnitude of West Sister Island. Um, so that I'll conclude that, although there are critters that do show up for, um, this is one of those bomb or not bomb, dummy bombs that, um, Rebecca was talking about for a while there where there was a red fox that lived on the island we called him swiper 
if any of you know about Dora the Explorer, Swiper the Red Fox and all that, well, I had, a couple of us had kids who are about the Dora age, so that's why we called him Swiper, but he was out there four years. Um, we saw him, and I assume he went out on the ice, out and somehow not enough to live on, out in the days during the winter, but um, he made it. About all I got. Any questions? Protest. I actually had two questions for you. Yep. Um, so we said when you guys did the cuts that the black crowned night herons would nest in the shorter vegetation, like in the center of the cut. Um, yep. Do you, did you know, did that increase risks of nest predation by maybe like bald eagles or something if they're in a more low, visibly exposed nest? They, they did not start nesting there for about two or three years. I immediately died, that's biologically speaking. So you could, uh, an eagle couldn't have dropped from a hundred feet up in a ball and into the nest. Okay. Um, it was a tangled mess. So they felt very secure um, when they had plenty of overhead cover. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So, and I don't know the dynamics of, um, I don't know. So yeah, I, we, it's not a concern question uh then i was gonna ask um with the vomiting nest defense mechanism uh would is there any sort of risk of chicks getting sick maybe like if a uh, vomit or excrement lands in the nest i mean i know in a lot of birds like bald eagles again whatnot like they'll usually just go to the bathroom in the nest but i was just curious um if that could pose any sort of risk to like the black crowns or the egrets as far I, as it. I don't think, uh, I mean, they, it's a, uh, no, I, I mean, the, uh, it's been a natural mess for years. I mean, for thousands, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, so I, I assume, yeah, well, and they throw up their lunch and he eats that instead of them so it's a substitution factor but i don't i don't believe that would be i mean we've seen um i've never it's hard to say i mean when you're walking out there you see all kinds of dead chicks you don't know what killed them yeah um, yeah so cool well, thank you what type of trees are they nesting in? And is there ever any yellow crowned herons nesting there on the island? Uh, predominant overstory tree is hackberry. Um, so that's what they nest in um, most dominantly. They don't seem to have a preference for um, trees that, that's never been looked at on this island, so I can't say for sure, but. Hackberry is what the is what they normally nest in, just because it's supposed to be dominant. To my knowledge, you've never seen any yellow crowns. We there has been a few snowy, uh, one or two snowies, and one or two cattle egrets. I think pop up Tom, but no better than me probably um, out there occasionally. But that's about the only two rare fur birds that do nest there. Does someone go out and uh, count the different nests every year or monitor the uh, island? Yep. Um, the, uh, it used to be a joint effort between the Division of Wildlife and Ottawa Refuge when we had a wetland, when the division had a wetland research station in, at, at uh, McGee, but that was disbanded in 2008 or 9 or 10 or something. So now the auto refuge still goes out. The division does help them. We send a couple people, but we're not near as involved as we were, but yes. Um, I don't know if they did it during COVID. I would think you, it's an 80 acre island with 10 people. You could probably spread out pretty, pretty well, but um, getting there, you have to be confined. But yes, they do monitor the nest so that we can continue to see what's going on with uh, populations. 
They took two boats out this year so that they could social distance a little better. Cool. Did you, did they didn't invite you, one of the chief mess checkers? <laughs> I didn't feel like getting crapped on this year. <laughs> it was hot this year. It was over 90 degrees. Oh, yeah. That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. There were no bugs, though. It wasn't bad for bugs, but oh, it was nope. hot. Ugh. When you were naming off all the bugs, I was just thinking in my head, okay, at least there's no ticks. I don't ever remember ticks out there. But there will uh, be. Yeah. They're starting to move into the islands. So yeah. how they get there, I don't know. Well, birds, I get ticks off birds. So yeah, that's true. Eventually they'll get there. So yeah, we we were out there once with the Canadian researcher. And so we it was earlier than we normally go. And she was uh eating an apple, but she took two bites of an apple and the flies were so bad, all you could, you couldn't see the white of the apple anymore. It was just flies. She's just like, here, take it. Through <laughs> it, it was, yeah. he was about ready to snap. That's awful. <laughs> With the black crown night herons, I've noticed that on April Fool's Day, three years in a row, not last year, but previous to that, um, I'll find like 39 to 43 of the black crown, crown night herons right there at, you know, where you get off the exit of Route 2 on 269 to Bayview. And there's a police yep. station there and three ponds and that first pond. And it's too bad they cut a lot of that down. But every year I would find them there on April Fool's Day, huh. April 1st. That's cool. So. Just uh, if anybody wants to check that out. So I don't know if some of those, you know, go from Bayview over to West Sister Island, you know, or not. Because I don't think they nest there. Or I don't know. Maybe they do. But usually I don't see them after a few days. Yeah. So I know this is the largest great blue heron and great egret rookery in the U.S. Great Lakes. Are black crown night herons on that list, too? Yes. So what other rookeries are in the area that if they're not out on the island, they are using? Well, there used to be a rookery right there, 269 and 2. That's what I was thinking, that's, like 15 uh, years ago, maybe? Yeah, that's greatly decreased. So, And then you got Turning Point Island in some Dusky Bay. Uh, there's a few that still go there, but that's decreased as well. So I think the numbers are way down. I mean, there used to be a lot of inland Rookery is not the real word you should be using, but heronry. Uh, but those have gra gradually decreased over the years. I can remember here in Seneca County near Tiffin, where I live, uh, back in the early 70s, there was one just north of Tiffin, and there were 80 to 100 nests in that woodlot. And probably the last 15 years, there haven't been any. So where those birds went, who knows? I suspect the populations are greatly decreased. Yes, I'll check the Turning Point Island in Sandusky every year, and there still are just, but just a couple. Right. Little nests there, yeah. And I remember that old rookery across, you know, Route 2 and 269. That was pretty big. All right, any other questions for Mr. Sherman? If not, we'll move on to Tom Bartlett, the well, Tom big. Bartlett, Master Bird Bander. <laughs> you like that picture, Tom? That's nice. Somebody <laughs> just sent me one today from that same shot. Uh, for those that don't know, that's a peregrine falcon. And it was the first one I ever banded. And he flew into one of my shorebird nets. And he almost got a she. It was a female. She almost got out. So I dove after her. And if you know about shorebird nets, they're usually stuck on mud flats, and there's not much mud left on that mud flat after I get done with her. Most of it was all over me. Well, it looks like. <laughs> but meanwhile, back at West Sister Island, uh, my first trip to West Sister Island was in the mid-70s with the late uh, Laurel Van Camp. I don't know if anybody knows of Laurel, but he was a game protector for Ottawa County for years, and then... He was essentially, I think, the first naturalist at McGee Marsh when they when they built the visitor center. And Laurel would go out and ban the uh, herons. And so I got invited out mid-70s. 
And at that time, there was still a little pasture right behind the, uh, the lighthouse. Because I can remember my first trip, there was a bobolink there. And it was late June. And we were banding, mainly banding night herons because they were nesting in the smaller trees, which were all poison ivy at that time. So like Dave said, you climbed up the tree, you reached in the nest, you got shit on, you got vomited on, and then you brought the bird back down to band it, you were stepping in the poison ivy and the nettles, and then the flies were biting you, and it was just so much fun. Uh, and we did that several times in the 70s, and then into the 80s. And my last trip, I think, until recently was in the 80s. I don't think I went back in the in the uh, 90s. I did once in the 2000s, but the last couple of years, uh, Ron Hoffman from the Refuge has been going out to do it. Dave talked about the nest surveys, and I've been able to go out for that. Now, last year, 2020, we didn't do it. We did it in 2019. We did it in 2021. Uh, the island is divided up into a grid. And I don't know, Dave, whether they're 50 yards or 50 feet, but it's Dave, all 50 square, yards. 50 yards. So you start on one side of the island and there's a stake in the ground and you stand there and you've got a 15 diameter, a 15 foot diameter circle. And you look up and you try to find any nests that are above you and you record how many nests, what species they are, uh, how many young might be in them. And then you move your next 50 yards and you do the same thing and you keep doing that. And uh, after this year, it's clear that Dave needs to go back out and clear some trees because the trees are really large now. And right. If it wasn't for the vomiting and the uh, fecal bombs, sometimes we wouldn't find these nests. Because all of a sudden you're standing there and you don't see a nest and then something comes down through the leaves and you move your vantage point a little bit and oh yeah there's a nest right there and there's a fish laying at your feet uh, but it was not buggy this year which i think it was 94 Jeez. It was no wind so it was yucky but no bugs plenty of nettles plenty of poison ivy plenty of birds but, uh, yep did did you did ron say as the numbers of night herring you know, I don't know, remember what the number was. I think it's been fairly stable the last few years, but I know it was nothing like when we were there in the in the 70s, there were over a thousand night herons, probably over 2,000 night herons on the island. And then it went way, way down. And then after you guys did your work, uh, it started to go back up again. But I think now the trees are getting too big for night herons. So I don't know where they're going. Yeah, we're so plenty most of the great night herons that in, in the 70s, were most of the night herons in that former pasture? Is that where you banded most of them? Just it? north of it and just to the east of it, yeah. Okay. All along that edge there. Yep. That and it was trees. almost all poison ivy trees. It was crazy. Okay. So, you know, they were a diameter of anywhere from four to six inches at the base. And yep. they went up 15, 20 feet. So you had to, you had long sleeve shirts on. And I know the last <laughs> time in the 80s, when we got done at the end of the day, uh, we were waiting for the boat to come back for us. We all looked at each other. We were sweaty. We we're covered in fecal matter and dead fish. And we just walked to the edge of the island and we didn't stop. <laughs> and when the boat showed up, we were all out there with our, only our heads sticking out of the water. It was, <laughs> it was crazy. But it was a nice ride back then as you cooled down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what else I'm supposed to talk about here about that research, but that one is ongoing research. And I think uh, if there's anybody out there, Ron's always looking for some sucker. I mean, some volunteers <laughs> to uh, go along. It's an easy learning curve once you get there. Uh, he likes to put people in pairs to cover the island. Uh, it's, but it's yeah, a neat place. I found one it. spot. The island is not flat. I, I had always thought it was flat. And for some reason... I never got to the north and the central part of the island. And it, there's actually a hill there. And on the east side of that hill this year, I found probably 15 or 20 of those big canisters. They look like big propane tanks. And they were just all laying in one area. I couldn't find anybody to kick one for me to see what would happen. But <laughs> next year, we'll find out. Maybe we'll get Matt to go. He won't. He's young enough. He wouldn't know any better, right? <laughs> I'll kick anything you ask me to. <laughs> Hey, this is Rebecca. It's finally quiet here for a minute. Um, 
I believe we did get permission to use chainsaws now. So it goes a lot faster, but nice. our limitation is the number of people we can get on a boat. Right. Okay. And we had yeah. a small boat this year. So they took us and I think there was eight of us maybe. Might have been only six of us, seven of us. So we took three or four and then took three or four. But we got it done. Yeah. You don't use the division. Nobody from the division uses, because we got that aluminum boat. And we used, uh, who's the new uh, law enforcement officer? He had Thank the boat from, uh, from the Detroit River, which was faster, but it was smaller. Okay. And he got us over there. And we had two people from the division, one intern and uh, another lady from Columbus who came out to help. Yeah, Laura. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah, our boats seem to be perpetually under repair. Okay. It's kind of funny. You have, had to go all the way down to Columbus to get somebody to go with you this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, Laura was there two years ago when we went across, too. So yeah. I think she likes to do that. She must have an office yeah. job. Need to get out once a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know how far else you want me to go into that. Uh, Dave's talked about third banning, 20 minutes. Am I 20 minutes up? Close. I do ban, for those that are interested, I do ban uh, songbirds on all the U.S. Lake Erie Islands except West Sister, North Bass, Middle Bass, South Bass, and Kelly's Island. And I started that on Kelly's back in 1996. Uh, I work with the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. We now have banded almost 40,000 birds on the Lake Erie Islands. And when you think we're only there a couple of weeks each year, although since I retired, I spent a lot more time on, on Kelly's Island. And uh, if I get lucky this fall, I also banned sawwet owls, the migrant sawwet owls on Kelly's Island. And I hope to hit a milestone this year of my 1,000th sawwet owl. Yes. We're now at 954. So I need 46 sawwet owls to... <laughs> They hit a thousand. And, uh, but we've had some interesting ones. I've caught sawwet owls that were banded in Massachusetts. Sawwet owls are banded in Quebec, Ontario, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, West Virginia. Last fall, I got one that was banded near Tippin here. The bird came down, got caught by Jim Kaufman. He banded it. Eight days later, I caught it on Kelly's Island. So it was headed back north already. <laughs> But all those banding stations are open to any of the people in the public. Uh, just send me an email. I'll tell you when we're there and you're welcome to come over. We do have some uh, protocols that we have to go through this year because of COVID, but you'll get to see birds. And if you're lucky, you'll get to have one shit on you. <laughs> Prop fecal matter, excuse me. It's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had some unusual birds on these islands. I, I don't know whether I can show this or not. I brought the, can you see this? Sure can. Western yeah. kingbird. What is it? Is that a western kingbird? Well, it looks like it, doesn't it? And that's what I called it when I saw it. So are you ready? Oh. This is the only specimen of this bird that has ever been recorded. Huh. I was I managed to capture the I found the bird. Paul and I found it on December 15th on a Christmas bird count on Kelly's. I managed to capture it on January 6th. That was like 10 degrees out. That bird should have been in Central South America at the time. I was able to collect feathers, collect data. Uh, I still think sometimes I probably should have taken the bird over to back of the wild and let them rehab it for the winter. But you know, as a bander, that's really not my job. But this, this was a wild bird, it was surviving. So I did put the band on it, let it go. We saw it for two more days and it never showed up again. But based on the uh, DNA analysis of the feathers that I sent in, mom was a Couch's kingbird and dad was a Western kingbird. And there's only one small area in the very southern part of Texas and a little bit into Mexico where those two pieces ever come in contact with each other. So it was an extremely unlikely uh, hybrid to exist. And he only responded to the Couch's kingbird call. He wouldn't respond to Western. He wouldn't respond to Tropical. 
Wouldn't respond to Eastern, just the couches. Oh. It was kind of fun, but you never know what you're going to see on That's these true. islands. Anything can show up. I don't know what I mentioned that day when I was on the first day on West Sister. There was a bobolink at the end of June. And the <laughs> field there was probably less than an acre, or maybe an acre or two. It wasn't very big. 1975, 76. That's a long time ago. Were you alive then, Dave? <laughs> I Barely. know Matt wasn't. I know Amy. <laughs> when I was, uh, I think last summer, there was a state park down in southern PA near where I was in grad school. And we had a, is it a Townsend Solitaire? Yep. We've had those on Kelly's a couple of times. Yeah, there was one down in PA that caused a big fuss. It was Amy. amazing. I got to go down and see it for a little bit. I've tried to capture them. I found it twice on Kelly's and tried to capture it both times. No luck. I had <laughs> Bohemian Waxlings. No luck. But uh, yeah, you get these weird things that show up and you never, you never know. We've had um, black throated gray warblers on Kelly's. Oh, wow. We had a lark sparrow on North Bass last June when we were over there banding. Uh, we did band uh, a year ago, we banded the Chuck Wills Widow on Kelly's. You know, that's a southern bird. It shouldn't be up that far north. You never know what's going to come out of They just try to come find you, Tom. That's all it is. They're just it looking for be. you. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Tom? Well, you thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Well, We'll go on to, to Matt here. Um, let me scroll down so you can see Matt. Um, so Matt is on the grass carp strike team for the University of Toledo. Just finished up his master's degree in environmental biology. And a couple of years ago, he was actually one of them. So he spent the summer facilitating summer camps for 8 to 12-year-olds. So Matt, we'll let you take it away. All righty. Uh, that is actually my official title. I'm not, I'm not just, uh, it's just make myself sound cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was on the job offer. Uh, so I made a small presentation real quick. I figured since I'm currently working on uh, an invasive species that is very prevalent in the Lake Erie region, that I would just go into a little brief overview of some of the more well-known invasive species in this area. And then since the cruise was supposed to be more angled toward birds and whatnot, I thought it might be nice. I'm a, uh, recreationally, I'm a big wildlife photographer and birder. So uh, I spent a lot of my time on my weekends and days off trying to find good spots for birds. So I made a little list that I thought I might share with some pictures I've taken just in case, I, I assume people would be close to the area. Um, Maybe if I found a spot that you may not know about, though I doubt it's because I've only been here for three months, <laughs> but I figured why not, so. Oh God, what's happening? You're sharing your screen. There you go, you're good. Didn't like that. <laughs> there we go, so here's my unnecessarily long title. Uh, so I called it a brief overview of invasive species in the Lake Erie region, as well as an equally brief overview of ideal birding spots in the aforementioned region. Could Spoken not- Spoken like a true scientist. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's supposed to be concise writing, but sometimes you gotta get a little fancy. Okay, so we'll start with invasives. We'll start with grass carp. Uh, I, because of our animal rights policy at the university, I'm not actually allowed to share any photos of grass carp we've caught, um, but I did find some online. Uh, so this is a grass carp. It's one of the, there's a group of four called the Asian carp that are considered a major uh, problem uh, that pose a very large threat to the freshwater systems of the United States. Uh, I believe it's grass carp, big head carp, silver carp, which are uh, the ones down south where you'll see people riding in a boat and suddenly they're bombarded by a hundred jumping carp. Those are silver carp and black carp, I believe are the fourth. Uh, currently, it is not believed that there are any silver or black carp in the Lake Erie watershed. 
Um, a little background on grass carp and how they got here. They were originally brought over for um, people that wanted to clear up the vegetation in their ponds. Uh, grass carp are herbivores. So you could drop one in a pond, it would eat all your vegetation, clear up your pond, make it look nice. Problem is, much like anything, or most of the things we import from other countries, it escaped from captivity. Uh, either from, a lot of times when people have an exotic animal they don't want anymore, they decide to just throw it in their nearest public waterway or just release it. Uh, typically, oh, no, not right for that. Typically, they don't die in the wild. Uh, sometimes they will, but in this case, they did not. Uh, another really interesting thing that's happening right now is to purchase a grass carp or sell a grass carp, it had to be sterile, uh, incapable of reproducing. We don't know how, but they are reproducing. In um, the Maumee River and the Sandusky River, I believe right now there is evidence of reproduction which is of course a major concern for an invasive species. Um, they don't have an established population or anything right now, but if they are able to reproduce and nothing is done about it, that could become a reality. Uh, that's a major concern because these are a very large herbivorous fish. So they have the potential to eat a huge swath of vegetation in the rivers and lakes. Obviously there's a lot of other native wildlife that relies on those, that vegetation. Uh, it's a big problem for sports fisheries and whatnot to uh, just a, a huge threat. Uh, my next picture, just to see, this is an average sized grass carp, if you can believe it. Uh, the caption I read on the photo is this was about 40 pounds. That's uh, slightly on the heavy side. That's about the largest I've personally pulled out of the river. I think right now the record was 60 pounds. Uh, maybe 50 pounds, but they are just massive fish. Really heavy, uh, fight like crazy, uh, very fast. Just, it's, it's unbelievable. I nearly throw out my shoulder every time I pull one onto the boat if you catch one. But yeah, so that's uh, that's what I'm currently working on. Our, we're primarily based in the Maumee and the Sandusky River, though we do what's called exploratory analysis. So we'll send a crew to go like maybe to the Black River, uh, the Cuyahoga River, things like that, just to look for them. Because I mean, if they're in these two rivers, they could easily be in others. And uh, we primarily catch grass carp by electrofishing. So we put little probes in the water that are attached to our boat. It sends an electrical current through the water that temporarily stuns fish within a certain radius. Um, it's actually very safe. There's a very low mortality rate of fish um, when you're electrofishing, we also use very, very long nets called trammel nets that will shock around with the hope of flushing fish into the net, which will then pull in. And if we have a grass carp, we capture it. Uh, moving on, another just a few common invasives I just wanted to touch so people are aware. If you're not already, this is purple loose strife. It's a very um, common concerning wetland invasive plant. Uh, if you drive along Route 2, you will see it everywhere. Especially right now, it's going crazy. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Uh, it's a major problem in wetlands. It's really invasive. It's very resilient. You can come, you can cut it down, do whatever you want to it, and it's going to come right back if you're not constantly on it. Uh, some of the problems it causes uh, recreationally, it can clog up water access, as you know, just get a little harder to get to the water. It outcompetes native wetland plants, which is a huge problem because they, those provide food and shelter to other wetland species. And purple loosestrife does not. Um, you could argue that it does, the flowers at least provide nectar for some pollinators, but compared to what plants should be there, purple loosestrife is very unideal. Uh, it, the roots that the plants produce can alter wetland hydrology, which means how water passes through a wetland. And one of the biggest components of a wetland is how the water runs through it. So that's always a concern. Uh, if you're talking invasive species, especially invasive plants, purple loosestrife is probably going to come up. Very, very uh, well known. Uh, actually, this one's in Lake Erie. It's the quagga mussel. Uh, 
like the next two I'm going to talk about. I've got round gobies and zebra mussels coming too. These were first introduced by ballast water being released by ships in Lake Erie. Uh, the big problem the quagga mussels cause is they can filter out algae in the water and between their very large numbers and how efficiently they filter out algae, it's basically reducing the food that's available for native mussels or native um, organisms in general. Another big problem is they can clog drainage systems like for electric plants or I, I think even just a, a regular boat, um, like a recreational boat, I think they can cause problems for too. Just not pleasant and hard to deal with. Same goes for the zebra mussels. So all the little ones are zebra mussels and they're attached to a native mussel. Same thing, they were introduced by ballast water. Uh, they filter out algae that other animals want to eat. Another thing these do is they attach and overwhelm native mussels, like in this picture. Uh, in a few of our nets that I've pulled up this year while at work, I've caught a couple mussels that were just absolutely coated. Uh, big problem, same thing, they can clog drainage systems. Interestingly though, uh, zebra mussels are um, eaten by round gobies. I think they're actually the round gobies primary prey. Uh, I don't believe round gobies were introduced to control zebra mussels. Uh, we've learned over many, many attempts that you should never, or it's highly unlikely that introducing another animal to fix the first animal's problem is going to work. It's happened uh, many times. Uh, you should look up the cane toad if you're interested in stories <laughs> like that. Um, but yeah, round gobies, another very serious invasive species in the lake, actually do eat zebra mussels. So that's uh, kind of interesting. You often, one of the reasons why an organism can be invasive is because it typically won't have predators. It's like the grass carp. The grass carp is massive. Not much, Nothing really can eat it if they wanted to, unless they're hitting it as a juvenile or things like that. So it's a lot like that with the zebra mussel, just nothing eats it but round gobies. And then speaking of round gobies, um, same thing, they were introduced uh, by ships and whatnot in the lake, in uh, Lake Erie. Uh, these are generalist fish, so they can live in a lot of places. They're very tolerant to different types of water conditions and whatnot, and they can eat a lot of things. Um, they outcompete a lot of the smaller fish, especially when they're in streams. So model sculpin um, are particularly at risk from round gobies because they can kick the sculpin out of breeding grounds. But there are a, a lot of, uh, I think, darters and shiners and whatnot that are also herding from round gobies. Uh, they can also eat fish eggs. So there have been some studies where they will intentionally displace, say, a, a smallmouth bass from its nest because bass will actively guard their eggs. And within a few minutes, a round goby can clean the whole nest out. That's hundreds of eggs just gone like that. So that's yeah, another huge problem. What's that? Are they up in the rivers? Yes. So you find them like in the Sandusky or the Maumee? I never see them. Um, I think because they sit at the riverbed that uh, when we do shock, they don't come up. But I, um, I don't know. I, I'm assuming they're in the Maumee and the Sandusky, but I know they do enter rivers or river systems. Mm -hmm. uh, another sort of nature kind of solving our, not solving isn't the right word, but sort of combating our issue is they actually found that Lake Erie water snakes and double crested cormorants really hammer round gobies. Um, round, uh, round goby invasion is actually attributed partially to Lake Erie water snake populations starting to recover. They weren't doing very well in this area, but now they eat a lot of round gobies and their numbers are coming up again. And it's the same thing with double crested cormorants. Um, I believe there's a study that says, or- uh, The regular um, meal stuff. So. But yeah, then there's some other- we're gonna come along. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. I'm like, I really want to be helping them, but I- We got hacked. <laughs> um, I believe the study was saying that, uh, Cormorants were a concern over eating sport fish, like 
smallmouth bass and whatnot, but with the round govies being so widespread that it's shifted the cormorant diet more to the gobies instead, and it's actually benefiting sport fish to a degree. It's not saying the round gobies are good. It's just one of the, uh, one of the few positive things that have come out of this invasion, I guess you could say. So before I go into my birding spots, I figured it would only make sense to talk about two invasive birds. First one is the European starling. Uh, Tom's favorite. Tom's favorite bird. Uh, <laughs> they are the worst birds. Uh, no redeeming qualities, as I like to say. Uh, I, I don't even like how they were introduced. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, I believe in the early 1900s, maybe 1800s, I can't remember. 1800s. It was 1800s. Yep. Uh, there was a Shakespeare Society fan club, however you want to call them, that got the idea in their heads that they wanted to introduce every species of animal that has ever been mentioned in a Shakespearean work to the United States. And I think it's in Macbeth. I don't know my Shakespeare very well. There's one line in a Shakespeare poem that says the word starling, which means they absolutely had to bring starlings over. So from a group of, I think the original population that was brought over was about a hundred starlings. Now we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands spread across the country, uh, just over, just because of William Shakespeare. It's all his fault. Uh, some people kind of like starlings just because, I mean, as you can see, they are very colorful, uh, iridescent birds. Um, He's not they, buying it. <laughs> I, 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 his head. <laughs> I, I hate them. I hate them so much. I get so mad. Uh, they're really aggressive. They'll uh, push other birds out of like feeders and whatnot. They'll, they'll um, be, uh, act aggressively toward them, scare them away. The thing I really hate is that they will peck and destroy other species' eggs if they come across the nest. Um, I did want to throw out one interesting way to help prevent starlings if people have backyard bird feeders. Starlings cannot eat black oil sunflower seeds. Uh, their beaks just are not struck built that way to eat those. Um, I saw this happen firsthand in our backyard. As soon as I read that, I started switching from just the mixed bird seed to just black oil. I almost never see starlings in my yard now. Um, almost all backyard species that are common to begin with still eat black oil, so it's not like you're starving native birds, but it does help uh, dissuade European starlings from entering your yard. Uh, number two, of course, is the house sparrow. They are the second worst birds. Uh, they do have one redeeming quality, unlike the starling, where it's actually been found um, that in very in more developed areas, merlins, uh, which are a species of falcon, will predate upon house sparrows. So at the very least, they feed some of our raptors. But other than that, get rid of them. They're just as aggressive as starlings. They will push other species away from your bird feeders and whatnot, they will force native species like bluebirds, specific for the bluebirds that were in my yard that I haven't seen in years and years, kick them out of their box. I wasn't very happy about that, <laughs> but they'll do it to wrens and anything. If they can get in a box, they will fight viciously to steal it from anything they um, that was originally there. So both very problematic species and Personally, my two least favorite of the invasives, just in general. So, move on. I just wanted to, figured I would go over a few of my favorite spots to go birding or take some uh, pictures. Uh, number one, of course, is the Wildlife Refuge at Ottawa. I go there as often as I can, uh, usually once a week, once every two weeks, depending on what's going on. Uh, just great variety of birds you can see um, around the visitor center and so I see you know goldfinches, eastern bluebirds, cedar waxwings, indigo buntings, there's all kinds of barn swallows, cliff swallows, they've got purple martin boxes, just it's a fantastic spot and then when you actually go out 
between the trails or the wildlife drive, tons of eagles. You can see osprey. I see terns out there sometimes, and they're just a ton of fun to watch as they hunt and fish. Uh, uh, the trumpeter swans are a big thing. People like to come see, and they're always cool. Uh, all sorts of different waterfowl that are going to be migrating in soon. Uh, I see lots of grebes, and I really like grebes, so that's always a plus. Uh, a wide variety of shorebirds. If you're on eBird, I've seen all kinds of weird stuff get reported on the wildlife drive this year. I saw, I believe, American avocets were in there for a little bit, a few black necked stilts. There was a wood stork. I don't know if he's still there or not. I haven't gotten to go see that. It wasn't uh, kind of, I was in the work truck on our way home when I found out there was a wood stork and I uh, freaked out a little bit because I was upset that I, didn't, that I didn't know about it. As of last <laughs> weekend, it was still around. Uh, we might we might try to come find that soon but uh yeah uh, i really like going to the refuge um, between the stuff that's always there and the fact that you might come across something exotic it's or, exotic's a bad word because it sounds like invasive species uh, something weird that shouldn't be there um yeah these are both photos i took there so it's a great spot for photography uh, more stuff you see there's a trumpeter swan in the top right an eagle I walked under on the trail and then I found an Eastern Fox snake right by the visitor center too, eating. That was really cool. Uh, number two, McGee Marsh. I'm assuming most people know about it, but I threw it in there just in case. Um, on Park Road 1, going toward the boardwalk, always you can see eagles, waterfowl, swallows, songbirds, herons and swans, just big variety. And then on the boardwalk, you can see warblers, you can see more warblers, you can see warbler vireos, and then even more warblers. It's mostly warblers, which is never a bad thing. I, I uh, didn't get to go there during my internship because it was closed for road uh, repairs and construction. I think it got washed out, didn't it? Or was that Metzger? No, Metzger, Metzger got washed out. washed out. But I was there last week to... There, and it's that wind just it wreaked havoc. It is going to be so different. There was chunks of the boardwalk that, when the trees got blown over, they pulled the boardwalk up. So there was one section of boardwalk I couldn't even touch. It was oh, over eight foot in the air. So it'll be interesting. It look it's going to look totally different next year. I can tell you that. <laughs> Uh, if anybody hasn't been to the boardwalk, though, it is amazing. I, th the first time I went this year, I got, I believe, five lifers in one day. It was just, it was awesome. I, I love it. Number three, Howard Marsh Metro Park. It's uh, a little further west on Route 2 from the Wildlife Refuge. Uh, I think 2017 was the first year it op was its opening year, I think. Maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was in the area when it did open, and I got to go there and see. Uh, it was a black neck stilt that pulled me over there because it was people were freaking out about it. So I got to see that. I got to see a yellow headed blackbird there I, that I'd never seen before. Um, this is probably my favorite spot to go birding in general. I just I really like Howard Marsh. Uh, it's good trails. You see some interesting wildlife. Uh, oh, I was there maybe three weekends ago, and I saw a family of common gallinules eating off the off of one of the boardwalks. And that was a ton of fun to watch them for a little bit. Uh, highly recommended, it's a great place. Number four, Oak Openings Metro Park. That's a bit more substantially further west from the refuge. It's, on, it's west of Toledo. Uh, I've only been there once because I'm waiting for mosquito season to die down a little bit before I go back. <laughs> I get destroyed. But uh, the first time I went, it was awesome. I saw this uh, Carolina wren. He was hanging out, singing a lot, establishing his territory. It was a lot of fun. A uh, huge variety of trails and habitat that you could find all sorts of things. And I'm, It's named after the oak opening habitat that you can find there, which is pretty, or no, an oak barren. I believe it's an oak barren. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a great place to spend a day walking or looking around, things like that. I, I really like it. Uh, 
Number five is Side Cut Metro Park in Maumee, Ohio. It's right along the Maumee River. I just discovered it a few weeks ago and it's pretty great. Another good spot for walking trails, uh, waterfowl, songbirds, raptors. You can find a lot of stuff. They have a wildlife window with bird feeders set up on one of the trails that you can just watch from a few feet away as stuff comes up to the feeders. Uh, I saw this belted kingfisher on one of the trails, which was a lot of fun. Uh, a little further down uh, the road from side cut, uh, you get to the fallen timber trails. And there's one that loops around a small lake that also cuts through a bit more of a grasslandy patch that I think is probably gonna turn up some pretty cool stuff every now and then. Uh, it wasn't very busy when I was there, but I that's probably gonna be my spot for a while because it's only 10 minutes from my apartment as opposed to the 40 minute drive to Ottawa. So um, I'll definitely be checking that out a little bit more often and I would recommend it. It's an easy trail, a lot of different habitat. I think it might be a cool place to see some stuff. Now, number six, I haven't actually been birding at, but I've got my eyes on it. This is my top secret spot that I don't like to tell people because I don't want people stealing. Oh, went ahead. I think this place is going to be awesome when the waterfowl migration really kicks in. It's uh, it's right at the end of the Riverwalk Trail in Maumee, right on the edge of the river that ends in a really tiny peninsula that you can just set up shop at. Uh, and you get a beautiful view of Audubon Island and the whole river. Uh, I think it. I think it's going to be. A, it's a really good spot. So, I, I I intend on spending a few early mornings there come September. And then finally, Maumee Bay State Park. Um, if anybody didn't hear about it, it was a pretty historic year for Maumee Bay. Uh, first time in over 80 years that piping plovers nested in Ohio. Uh, and it was absolutely incredible. I got to see it while the nest was still active and taped off and everything, then came back, saw the chicks walking around while they were still small and fluffy, and then I had one more chance to come hang out with them for a little bit while the chicks were just getting ready to migrate. I think... I'm providing the thing in I think they migrated officially, like, one or two days after I took this photo. Uh... Beautiful birds, very small. They're very bold too. I mean, you would walk around or you would post up on a spot and they'll walk up to you. I, I think I was maybe six feet from the bird when I took this picture. And I just we, I was with a few of the volunteers that were working to watch the plovers over the summer. And two of them were just walking right around us the whole time. It was amazing. Uh, so that was really cool. You could see there all banded very thoroughly, hoping they come back again next year. I don't know if they return to the same breeding grounds each year, but um, it was very cool. I, that's probably the most significant experience I've had birding as far as like running into something rare or meaningful. Uh, but Mommy Bay has some really great spots to go birding to. And then I want to throw out a shameless plug to my photography page that I run on Instagram. <laughs> it's called at Branches, Brooks and Boggs. I post all kinds of cool stuff. I try to keep it factual. I'm a big proponent of public education, um, specifically about the environment and things like that. I, I also have an Etsy store that I am kind of trying to get off the ground. I sell digital prints, uh, if anybody wants oh, to check it there. out. Yeah, it's a, it's a work in progress. Uh, I'm, I need to expand it a little bit, but the, I, I'm very proud of the Instagram page, at least. I, it, it's a small little following, but it gives me a chance to practice my creative writing and do some public education and just share photos because I, I love nature photography. It's my biggest hobby. And I do have citations for the photos. I didn't, I didn't just steal. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's all I got. If anybody has any questions. Did I go over? I, I get a bit long-winded when I talk about this kind of stuff. That's okay. We all get excited about it. <laughs> yep. We just had a question about the Audubon Island State Nature Preserve in Maumee. 
we've never heard of that before. So could you give a little more details on how to get there? I, I've never been to Audubon Island. I don't know if it's open to the public or not. I, th I think it is, but um, okay. I, th I think you have to have a boat to get there. There's no like, or and I don't know of any like public like ferrying service or something like that that'll take you there. Maybe if you're adventurous, a kayak. Yeah, oh, I see people kayaking on that part of the Maumee. It's pretty, well, relatively tame. Okay, thank but you. But I do see, yeah, no problem. Thank you so much, Matt. That was great. Got some no new problem. ideas of places to go myself. <laughs> Good. This is what we uh, should be out looking at right now. Um, shoot. Here's a shot of West Sister Island right about sunset. So we're right about sunset right now. Wish we were out there, but here we are. We thank you all for joining us on Zoom and uh, getting to hear from our speakers. And guys, I thank you for coming out and um, taking your evening, spending it with us, sharing your expertise and your hot spots for birds. And if we have any other questions or discussion or comments, we'll take them now. Um, I just have a comment and a question. Thank you for this. This was very nice. We appreciate it. Um, the other question is, do you expect a decent migration for the monarch butterflies this year? I know it's been a few years since they've hit the refuge hard, but just curious. It's kind of always hard to predict. You never know really what's going to happen, but the peak days for migration in our area start September 5th and go through about the 16th. So if um, if there's gonna be a giant cluster of them someplace, that should be about the time that we see them. Um, it's so funny that you ask about that because I actually had an email scheduled for like tomorrow morning that's gonna go out and talk a little bit more about that. So you're probably gonna have that in your inbox here shortly. Thank um, you. Yeah, but um, if there are any big roosting sites, we'll definitely reach out and let you know where on the refuge to check them out. Um, 2018 was the year that we had, you know, thousands of them on the refuge, and that was kind of a fluke. We had a hurricane, I think it was Hurricane Gordon, remnants of it came up, and kind of perfect storm for us. Monarchs were coming across the lake the same time the storm was coming up from the south, and they just collided, and so we had lots and lots of butterflies sitting on the refuge for days at a time. It's very interesting, but um, really hard to predict how many are going to be in one spot. Thank you. A few years prior to that, we lived out by um, Lake Erie in Oregon, and we had an acre, and we had about 70-some pine trees just on that acre, and they were very predominant, maybe 2008, I think it was, so we were hopeful that we'll see him again. So thank you for the information. You're welcome. It's so funny you mentioned pine trees because my uh, my parents live right down the road from me and the white pine trees seem to be where they roost in their yard all the time. I don't know what's up with that, but that's where we always end up seeing them out here. Any other questions? Thanks, Amy, for organizing this tonight. Oh, this sure has been a thing. wonderful presentation, and um, I enjoyed all the speakers. And Matt, thanks for sharing your secret spot. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, check that out. <laughs> that and Side Cut Metro Park, which I've never been to before. So I've got very nice. places to try. Highly recommended. Well, I just got one more slide for us here. If you are interested in more information about the Friends and what we do, you can find us online, friendsofottawanwr.org. Find us on Facebook. We also have a photo club group on there, which Matt, I don't know if you're on that. You should probably get joined up on there. I, I should. You really should. And uh, West Sister Island books that Rebecca mentioned and some other West Sister Island related merchandise, t-shirts and mugs and stuff are available on our website. The link to it was way longer than it needed to be, so I made it shorter for you, but uh, you can check that out. But um, thank you all so much for hopping on and joining us, and I uh, hope you have a great weekend. And next time we're able to do this cruise, you're going to be on a list of people who get to hear about it first, so that hopefully we can actually take you out and uh, take you around the island. All right, guys, Tom, 
Matt, Dave, Rebecca, thank you so much for hopping on here and sharing your evening. Yeah, okay. definitely. See you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Off. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to next year and the crew. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Dave signed off. How do I sign off? We'll hit the button, Tom, and then we'll all be off. <laughs> <laughs> I hit Have the a good night. Take care.